We're heading to the east side of the Sea of Galilee today for an amazing story about transformation. Stay tuned. Shalom once again, and we are honored to have you with us on this teaching channel. You know, we're all about teaching the Bible in the context of the land of Israel. In fact, this is our playing board, as we like to refer it to. And uh, this map is actually what we teach. We teach the Bible as it unfolds somewhere on this map here. In fact, right there is where we're heading to the Sea of Galilee today for a story about the transformation of a a demoniac, a demon-possessed man. And it's a story that, of course, involves Jesus. By the way, unless I forget, uh, make sure that you hit our subscribe and bell there if you want to track any of our future teachings on this channel. We would be delighted and honored if you would do that and certainly share these videos with your friends and your family. So what do you think about when I say the word transformation. Maybe you think of a a caterpillar changing into a butterfly. That's indeed a great example of transformation. Well, when I think of transformation, I think of uh, Jesus taking the life of someone who, like this demoniac, has no purpose, no, no hope in life, and through the conversation that he has and certainly what Jesus would do on his behalf, this man would be exercised from the demons into a a completely new creation. And it's a remarkable story uh, that unfolds in the Gospels, of course, and we're going to use the story narrative from Mark chapter 5 today in this teaching. So let's head to the Sea of Galilee and see where it happened together. Israel, once again, is our destination for this teaching. Israel is a small parcel of land in the context of the larger ancient Near East. We're heading to the north in this teaching, to the Sea of Galilee, which is a lake about 13 miles long and maybe 7 or so miles wide at its widest point. And the great story that we're going to cover today is the transformation story of the demoniac as recorded in Mark 5. Here is the lake, and especially on the east side is where we're heading. You can see the east side from the top of the Cliffs of Arbel, one of our favorite perspective points. As we can see, almost the entire north part of the lake, including the plains of Gennesaret, the Man of Beatitudes, Capernaum, Chorazin, Bethsaida. Jesus and his disciples launched their boat from this northwest corner on this day, as recorded in Mark 5, to the east side or to the other side of the lake. Here's the lake. And it's the east side, which will be our destination. We're in the area of the Decapolis. The Decapolis was a number of cities, ten in, in specifically. Uh, one of those uh, cities is the city of Jerash. This archaeological illustration really depicts how large the city was. Today, it's quite impressive. It's in the country of Jordan today. But uh, we want to take a look at some of these cities of the Decapolis because this was where Jesus and his disciples were heading. Cities with colonnaded streets, massive theaters, complete with at least a portion of what is called the skene of this theater. 
every Roman city had a skene. Every Roman city had multiple temples as well, like this one of the Temple of Artemis. Gadara is a city still in Jordan, but it's on the southeast side of the Sea of Galilee. So from the top of Gadara, we can actually look down into Israel across on the other side. The city is also very impressive with their ruins, both limestone and you can see the blackened stone, the basaltic stone. Columns, streets, temples, bathhouses. Just like the one city on the west side of the, the Jordan River, it's called Beit Shan. We go here every trip when we lead tours to Israel, complete with a theater, the Agora or the Forum, bathhouses, the Odeon, a smaller theater, and most likely a temple on top of the Old Testament tell, which is depicted here in green. When King Saul died on Mount Geboa close by, his body was hung on the walls of the city. But look how massive the Roman city actually was. It still is quite impressive today. Would Jesus have gone into Roman cities? Most likely not. Even this capital here with uh, this image on it, Dionysus, lining this street with columns. A bathhouse, in fact the most impressive one in all of Israel is here. There would have been a floor over top of these rounded structures. Uh, the rounded structures allowed hot air to actually circulate below the floor level. And uh, you had a, uh, the reason for a bathhouse here that was uh, part cold, part hot. And certainly this was uh, where uh, the, the hot air was sort of blown in under the floor and it provided a very nice experience for the Romans. But from the top of the tell, you can actually see the colonnaded street, the bathhouse to your right and the theater. And of course, the latrine, as our students are carefully taking care of business here. One other site on this east side of the lake is the city of Hippos, or Sosita. It's a Hebrew word that means horse. You can see across to the west side of the lake, the beautiful uh, flowers here in the March, or I think it was April perhaps, when this shot was taken. Uh, but this is an impressive site, a Roman site once again, but with many late Roman churches such as this one being built here later on. Keep that in mind because perhaps the testimony of the transformed demoniac had a role or a, a place in that what took place with the churches being developed here. So looking across to the west side of the lake, uh, we can really appreciate the ruins. Tiberius is now in view on the west side of this lake. This is still in Israel, this particular city, whereas Jerash and Gadara are in the country of Jordan today. So if we just f try to fly over with our drone, this city of Hippos or Sosita, you'll get a sense of how impressive these ruins still are today. This is an active archaeological site. It's being excavated uh, almost every summer now. And even though it's a cloudy day on this uh, particular afternoon, you can see that the city overlooked this whole eastern side of the lake. I'm going to suggest that it was between this site and a little to the north, to the, another site that we're going to, where the story of Mark 5 unfolds for us. This drone video may be a little choppy in this presentation. We apologize for this.
lots of stones to move. Most of this at one point was under the ground until archaeologists came and exposed it. But appreciate the view here from the east side, specifically the southeast side of the lake, looking across to the other side. Down in this area here, off the shoreline, is where the Mark V story most likely took place. Massive ruins, carefully excavated, and now exposed for our enjoyment. So as we move on here to our next uh, site here, we're going to end up going over here to uh, this northeast corner of the lake. But notice again, as we've shared before in other presentations, a careful study has revealed that there are 15 or so ancient harbors around the Sea of Galilee, which is a freshwater lake. Here on the north side, there was one over here and a few on the west side. But uh, our attention will be over here in this east side of the lake. Today there's a Roman city. It's a late Roman city called Cursi. Of course, there's a, a later Byzantine church built here. Byzantine being 4th, 5th, and 6th century AD. But here near the water's edge is a cliff. And keep this in mind because just off the cliff was the shoreline of the water. This is where we pick up the story. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerizines. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Notice that it's only Jesus getting out of the boat. This area would have been off limits for Jews who would not want to defile themselves by even having a shadow of a Gentile fall on them. Well, this man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about two thousand in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and they told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. 
So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis. There's the there's the name of this grouping or cluster of Roman cities. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Could it be that this is the cliff area where the pigs ran down? Jesus exercised the demons out of the man, and they went down into the water and drowned. The power and authority of Jesus is displayed once again in this story. And remarkably, this man is transformed. And Jesus says, go and tell your family what had happened to you. It is a great and wonderful story of transformation. You know, I love that last part of the story where Jesus is about to go and this man who's now been transformed by the touch of Jesus, his demons are gone, he has a new life, and he wants to go with Jesus. And what does Jesus say to him? Simply this, go and tell your family, go tell your town what God has done for you. It's a great example of how evangelism works. You know, we we sometimes are threatened by that word, but it's really a word that simply means telling your story of how Jesus touched your life. And certainly I can tell that story, uh, being transformed as a kid, understanding who Jesus is, that he came and uh, took my place on the cross. Uh, He came to be my substitute. And he paid for my sins. Well, that's, in 10 seconds, uh, an abbreviated uh, part of my my own story, my own redemptive story, if you will. But this story is an unbelievable one because uh, as these Jews were reluctant to go to the east side of the lake, uh, Jesus does, and as I mentioned, it's only Jesus who gets out of the boat. Uh, None of his disciples would lest they be contaminated or made unclean by these Gentiles. But Jesus was not concerned at all about this. His main mission was to transform this person, and that's exactly what happened. I don't know where you are in your own life, but I'm hoping that you are looking to Jesus to continually uh, transform you. I know that's my prayer, and I hope it's your prayer as well. We do that step by step. We accept him as our Lord and Savior. We we learn about him in the Bible, and we strive through the Holy Spirit to live for him and even tell others about the story, our personal story, of how Jesus touched our life. So that's the teaching for today. Uh, Again, until next time, uh, thanks, and uh, we'll see you soon.